Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 15th, 2015, and my guest is Martin Weitzman, professor of economics at Harvard University and the co-author with Gernot Wagner of Climate Shock, The Economic Consequences of a Hotter Planet, which is the subject of today's conversation. Martin, welcome to Econ Talk. Nice to be here. Now, you argue that prudence requires doing something uh, about the growing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Give us an overview of what you see as the big picture version of the problem, why action is a good idea, and in particular, what What's the ideal of what we ought to do about it? Well, uh, in the book and in other contexts, I or we have argued that uh, the, the, the most important way to view, single way to view the, the economics of climate change is primarily as a problem in, of risk management. Uh, you can't, we don't know what's going to happen. It's highly uncertain what the outcome is going to be on temperatures, on uh, weather patterns, and so forth. Um, and uh, instead of trying to pretend that it's deterministic by taking average values, we really need to look at the whole probability distribution of outcomes. And when we do that, uh, we see that there is an uncomfortable amount of probability small, but it's not negligible, that there will be really very bad outcomes, that uh, temperatures really could go up a great deal with a small probability, but not small enough to comfort us. So what, uh, what, what we should be doing, the way we should be thinking about this, is more like a problem of buying insurance against terrible outcomes uh, than it is to lower the average of such outcomes. So this is a, as you say in the book, this is a fat tail problem in your mind. Uh, what N- Nassim Taleb has talked about on this program with respect to finance, and also he has argued with respect to both uh, GMOs and climate change that there's such a catastrophic risk. Uh, a catastrophic outcome of a low probability, but that probability is not low enough that we can ignore it. Is that a good way to summarize it? Yes, it is. Let's talk about why you think it's a fat tail rather than a unlikelihood. We've had, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, 0.8 degrees of uh, Celsius warming, which is 1.4 Fahrenheit uh, above pre-industrial times. Uh, what is the uh, black swan. What's the catastrophic outcome that you worry? Think we should worry about, and and what would the consequences be? Well, um, at eight degrees centigrade, uh, we probably can, and we are living with it. It's going to go up, even if there were no more carbon dioxide emitted. What's in the pipeline already uh, is going to cause temperatures to go above 0. 0.8 degrees centigrade. But in these lowish ranges, say less than two degrees centigrade, we have some more confidence that uh, that we can uh, cope with uh, with the problem. When it starts, when carbon dioxide concentrations, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere get high enough, then you really might get into the six degree or four degree range. Uh, and we did a, in the book some fairly simple calculations, but they, they were calculations that if you uh, – I'll get a little bit – I'll throw a few numbers in here. Before the Industrial Revolution, the uh, level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million. And it had hardly ever been above 280 parts per million 
in 800,000 years. We know that 800,000 years from Arctic ice cores. And it stands to reason we've been in this period of uh, glacial advances and retreats for about 3 million years. So this is probably uh, at the upper end of what parts per million of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases were for the last 3 million years or so. Now we're up to about 440 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent gases. That's an increase of 50% over what was the highest for the last 3 million years, at least. Um, when you look at it, when you ask what is, what is going to happen with 440 parts per million, uh, you're looking at something called a, a, a famous uh, acronym in uh, climate change, something called climate sensitivity. And that is an iconic number that tells us the eventual temperature change that goes along with a greenhouse gas concentration. It's a probability distribution. Uh, so this essential thing about what will be the temperature response to 440 or to 560 is an answer that that has a distribution. And the climate sensitivity is the temperature change for a doubling of carbon dioxide. So we're not there yet, but it's almost sure that we'll reach at least that, at least 560 parts per million. The, for the last 35 years, uh, the, the, the uncertainty around this climate sensitivity, this temperature response, has not much changed. 35 years ago, in some of the first early pioneering studies, it was stated that it's likely between a one and a half degrees centigrade and three and a half uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it, it, uh, it, it's likely between one and a half degrees centigrade and four and a half degrees centigrade. So that's a pretty wide range, uh, one and a half to four and a half degrees centigrade. And that's in the latest IPCC report from last year, it gives that same range. So that what's, uh, what's happened seemingly is that although there's been much, much more research into climate change and many, many more models and observations, we must be uncovered as we, as we're resolving some of the uncertainty about something like climate sensitivity, new forms of uncertainty are emerging. So there's other things that we hadn't counted on. Okay. So this one degree centigrade to four and a half degrees centigrade. What we estimated is that if the climate, if the uh, greenhouse gas concentrations double, the chance of being greater than four and a half degrees centigrade is around 10%. If, uh, if uh, greenhouse gas concentrations double, the probability of being greater than six degrees centigrade response is around 3%. So this is the bad tale. Uh, of uh, of climate sensitivity, which is symbolic of the bad tale of what the damages could be. And these numbers just seem alarming uh, with a doubling of CO2, which is almost inevitable. Uh, there's a 3% chance of having temperatures greater than, uh, uh, temperature response greater than six degrees. If we go to uh, uh, to a, a concentration of greenhouse gases of 700 parts per million. And that's a number that's thrown around. Uh, for example, the International Energy Agency, that's their most likely scenario, taking account of all the pledges that have been made and so forth. Their as point estimate is that we will reach 700 uh, within a century. If it's at 700, then the probability that the temperature response is greater than six degrees centigrade becomes around 10%. So that's what, that, that's my best translation into actual numbers of what it means to have a fat tail. Those 3%, 10% probabilities are low. They're unlikely, but they're not nearly so low uh, as to put our minds at ease. And that's what I we see as the major driving factor in wanting to mitigate carbon dioxide emissions. 
So it's oh, not so much what happens in the middle, so much as what's happening in those bad tales. Yeah, so the outcome there is so catastrophic, the argument goes, that the fact that it's, quote, only 10 percent or only 3 percent is not comforting. It's um, th Those are alarmingly large probabilities of a very, very bad event, exactly. which would be a temperature increase. And j just to keep the, um, the numbers clean, it, we're at 440 now, parts per million in the atmosphere, pre-industrial with think is around 280. So that's your point that we're about 50% higher. We, we, we expect to get to double the pre-industrial concentration. That's, that's what you said is inevitable. That's 560. If we get something close to double where we are now, we get to 700 and above. And there you're suggesting that the odds then of a at least six degree centigrade increase would be 10%. And six degrees is considered to be a pretty, something above six would be uh, life altering. So before we, before we talk about the, the probabilities of that 700, because I want to come back to that, whether that's a realistic concern, what else goes into that number, what do you think we know? And you can see it many times in the book, there are many things we don't know still, but what do you think we know about life on earth at six degrees centigrade above the current average? Lord, you'd have to for that, you'd have to go way back uh, to, to find that much carbon dioxide, to, to, an increase of that much carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas uh, that rapidly. So that much that rapidly to 700 hasn't been seen for at least 50 million years. Uh, 50 million years ago, there was a, a spike in temperatures that was something like this four or five degrees. And it's, and there also were higher levels of carbon dioxide. So we really are going way, way back. That would alter six degrees centigrade. If that were achieved would, 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 uh, uh, would alter life on earth as we know it. Um, it we're, we're into the, fantasy world here and guessing what that would be like, it would uh, completely upend eco ecosystems and cause a lot of species to go extinct. I don't know what would happen to humans. I don't see how anybody can know. Uh, maybe we'd be clever enough to uh, figure out how to live underground or, or something like that. Uh, science has achieved marvelous things, but it it, it, it somehow wouldn't be at all, I'm, I'm guessing, a pleasant existence, and uh, we would miss life on Earth as we know it today. Uh, you'd have a lot of trouble venturing outside uh, uh, your underground shelter if you could even survive at all at 700 parts per million. So again, that's going, it, it, it was that that first, it was numbers like that that first really started to b bother and then alarm me about climate change, that you put it in, in geological historical perspective, and what we're doing is really tampering with these greenhouse gas levels uh, to an extent, by the time we're done, that it hasn't been seen for at least 50 million years. Uh, well, that's a big deal, and if, if, if there's the amount of uncertainty that IPCC seems to think there is this incredible range of uh, climate sensitivity between one and a half and four and a half degrees centigrade. If there are ranges like that for what the response <laughs> is, uh, we haven't seen such things uh, since, uh, as I say, 50 million years ago. So I, I'm going to make an analogy I've made here before, which is it does remind me a little bit of macroeconomics, uh, which is something I have a uh, a similar uh, agnosticism about or sometimes a skepticism. So in macroeconomics, uh, we are told there's a theoretical reason to expect that certain – a dollar of government spending financed by debt will have a certain impact on GDP and, and on unemployment. And if it doesn't happen, uh, say after World War II, as, as was predicted, uh, when government spending shrunk and we were told we would have a catastrophic uh, economy – and then we say, well, there were other things we didn't anticipate, and the theory survives. So what is your thought on the last 15 or 16 years, uh, sometimes called the pause, where concentrations of carbon dioxide have risen dramatically 
as China has grown dramatically, uh, the world economy has grown dramatically, and yet the expected temperature increases didn't happen, haven't happened. It's true, the world remains hot, but the theory is predicting that it should get a lot hotter. Um, does that give you any uncertainty about this relationship between uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and temperature and the likelihood that 700 parts per million is going to be six plus degrees centigrade hotter than it is now? Uh, with a t- uh, with a with a ten percent probability, well, I think it emphasizes how unsure we are. The models are all pointing in a general direction of the planet heating, but they can't really capture. They certainly can't capture year to year changes or even decade to decade. The big picture is that see if you look at a plot of temperature against time. It's as if there were, we were on a plateau now, but that's looking back for 12 years or so. Uh, the, the, if you look decade by decade, there's an unambiguous increase in, uh, in temperature. It's indicating we don't know, and maybe, maybe the effect is going to be more benign, but it's not nearly enough years or enough data to, uh, undo this thinking that we're headed for uh, pretty high temperature changes. There's things that the models somehow can't seem to model very well, and that are maybe very important. Cloud formation. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. That's a big, a huge deal in saying what the temperature change will be. Uh, none of the models predicted the melting of Arctic sea ice, which has uh, continued to uh, uh, increase the melting of Arctic sea ice, that was not predicted. And you have to twiddle with the models to try to make them come out with something like that. So uh, I guess I want to... We're good at twiddling. As, as, As econometricians, for example, we know how to do that. Yeah, uh, but if every time you need to revise, if every time there's some news you need to revise a model, you're uh, you're left unsure about the uncertainty in it. Correct. So, well, let's move to the uh, one policy change that you talk about quite a bit in the book, and many other economists continue to come back to, which is the tax on carbon. So you argue that we should put a $40 per ton uh, tax on carbon to at least begin reducing the rate of increase um, that we're currently uh, having in in CO2 in the atmosphere. Where does that number come from or what's our best uh, – what's our best way we have to, to make a stab at that number? And the okay. reason I ask that – the reason I ask that is that, we, you know, we know – we understand something – about other types of pollutants and their impact on health, say, or the economy, and we have a measure of the externality at the margin. This is a strange one because, as you say, in our current existence, we're getting along okay with the 0.8 that we've had. Um, it's not obvious that an extra half a degree should be discouraged. It's a non – when I think about it, it's an inframarginal problem really, right? Yes, I suppose. So, so where does – make a case for 40. Okay. I can't make a very firm <laughs> case and no one can. Honest the, man. <laughs> uh, like, like so much else in this area of climate change, that's a calculation based on a series of models. It, uh, it's the, it's a, a, common, a consortium, as it were, of U.S. government agencies that got together uh, – uh, including the uh, Department of the Interior, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Treasury, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, they they formed a fairly large task force to come up with what the price on carbon that would be used in regulation by the EPA. The Supreme Court said and mandated that EPA should take account of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, it's not that they're actually that they're going to put a forty dollar tax on carbon dioxide. They don't have the power to do that. But in evaluating various uh, uh, 
um, new technologies and, and, and machinery and, uh, uh, and, and, and various uh, controls, they, they're using this number. Where did they get it from? Well, what they, the, the thought experiment is this. You have some given trajectory of carbon dioxide emissions and carbon dioxide concentrations and then temperatures that go along with that. It might be uncertain, but you have a, a, a sort of projected profile of temperatures and damages into the future. Um, then you do a thought experiment via the computer. You make there be one less ton of carbon dioxide that's emitted this year. That'll translate into fractionally lower temperatures in the future and fractionally lower damages in the future. And then you take these damages, uh, these change damages, and discount them back to the present and ask what is the so-called cost of carbon, which is really the, the price of carbon that's coming out of the model that it wants you to, uh, to, to impose. Um, they use three models, three so-called integrated assessment models, IAM, uh, and they got three different answers. They just averaged them, and a huge part of the uncertainty about this $40 per ton comes from the discounting aspect. If you discount it, 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 it because the consequences of climate change unfold across centuries and even millennia and certainly generations, the discount rate you use becomes absolutely critical. And the discount rate they used was uh, 3%. They looked at 2.5% and 5%. You get very different numbers for 2.5% uh, uh, for or for 5% or for any change in the discount rate. So the deficiencies of this ambiguities of it are known to those who work in this area. Uh, this is not in any sense a hard and firm number, but it's sort of a ballpark estimate uh, that's very sensitive to a bunch of assumptions, including especially the discount rate. And uh, that's the number that, uh, that, that they came up with after averaging over, uh, over three models. So that, that, that's where that number $40 comes from. So right now, we worldwide, you suggest that we subsidize – right now in reality, we subsidize carbon in various ways, which yes. it would certainly seem to me, regardless of what you think of climate change, that that would be a good thing to stop. And you point out that that's – whether that's a good thing or not, it's very hard to stop politically. Uh, but if we if we reverse that and on and and stop subsidizing and instead taxed it, one question uh, to ask would be: What is the likely cost of that level of taxation on um, economic growth or on people living in very poor places that desperately need energy to catch up? Um, you didn't talk much about that in the book. I was I was a little bit surprised. Do you have any feel for what kind of magnitudes that kind of tax would have on, say, the price of gasoline per gallon? Something that would be more easily related to to as a consumer. Uh, I think forty dollars per ton of carbon dioxide doesn't affect gasoline that much. I think it's about it'll come out to about four cents per gallon. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the U.S., where it's already uh, where it's already taxed, it would uh, uh, would show up for sure in electricity prices. One point I want to make clear, which is a difficult point to get across uh, to the public, um, if you when the public thinks of a tax of forty dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, say they think of that forty dollars as going somewhere away from them. It goes into a sinkhole or it's transferred to another country or it's Planet. transferred <laughs> yeah, to another, the United Nations or something like that. That's not the case. This tax really represents a country that would be taxing itself on carbon dioxide. And with the receipts that they gather on the carbon dioxide from that $40 per ton of carbon dioxide, they could do things 
like relieve more distortionary taxes elsewhere because a bunch of calculations show that if you if you tax this you end up better from a welfare point of view if you tax this bad of carbon dioxide and relieve taxes on goods such as labor or or capital uh, so this would allow a, uh, a, 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 a a refund of forty dollars per carbon dioxide ton going elsewhere into the economy. In theory, and in theory, at it, least, it, yeah, yes. And and people have thrown around numbers. There's models and there's numbers, and some of the models seem to indicate that actually, if judiciously done, famous last words, uh, this could increase. Uh, national welfare because you're, you're you're eliminating or cutting back on distortionary taxes. Uh, so depending upon what the, the, the hurt that it does depends a lot on what you do with that uh, with with the proceed the internal proceeds of the tax. So the idea maybe it's better to call it a price on carbon. The idea is that a country would price carbon, hopefully at forty dollars per ton would collect these receipts and use it to offset taxes elsewhere or to do other – Or to do other uh, good things in theory if they had yeah. good things to do with the money in so general. That, is that, that's, that's something that's, that's very hard. We economists haven't done a good job of that, of explaining that, that it's not a tax in the sense that it's going away from you and to some larger entity and disappearing from you. But the nation as a whole, it doesn't disappear from the nation. The nation collects it. Well, it, it'll go away from you if you're a heavy user of – relatively, it will go away from you if you're a heavy user of, of carbon in whatever dimension that comes out. So if that you like correct. mail order, if you do a lot of mail order shopping, uh, this is going to increase the cost of uh, air – of, of you know, jet fuel and other mm -hmm. things that are electricity uh, intensive, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the point – the basic point you're making is a very important one. The goal here isn't to make government bigger. Although people worry that's what it would do, they were what it, the goal of it at least would be to reallocate, not reallocate, but alter the price of carb the price of carbon relative to other goods that are currently dis priced too uh, too high because of the taxes that are that are put on them. So that that in theory could be uh, a welfare improving tax, at least in theory. The other alternative, which you which you mention, is is some kind of cap and trade scheme, and it seems to me that. Given that many of the effects occur at sort of a, a, a tipping point of sorts at say five, six hundred, maybe seven hundred parts per million, that ideally, I'm going to emphasize ideally, ideally you would want to put some kind of total cap on global emissions and then allow people to trade those, allow corporations and governments to trade those so that the allocation of that f a fixed amount was was in some sense efficient. Of course, that could be that if you don't endow people with certain amounts, you can certainly make the argument that poor countries should get bigger allocations to start with uh, because they are behind, and then it would seem to be a very cruel system, as is the tax, uh, to to punish them, make it harder for them to catch up. But in theory, you could create a uh, to in, you you could give people an endowment of these uh, rights to emit. Allow it to be traded, and then uh, you could make sure you didn't go over six hundred or five hundred, if if you knew how to monitor and enforce it, right? It, yes, it, it, uh, some tricky parts in that. First of all, the thing you care about is not the emissions per se; it's the accumulation of the stock of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, and that becomes a little trickier how to link that to a cap and trade uh, system. Uh, look, there a cap and trade system and a tax or price on carbon are very similarly related. And within the United States or within the advanced OECD countries, um, I'd say, geez, it'd be great if you could get either one of these uh, meaningful and meaningfully linked up. But when it comes to the entire world, including the developing countries. My own opinion is that a cap and trade system is inferior to this uh, general agreement to put a price on carbon um, for several reasons. 
One is that the uh, by putting a price on carbon, you're stabilizing the price of energy. Uh, it, it's going to be linked to that price of carbon. If you have a cap and trade system, energy prices could go all over the place, depending upon whether you're in a recession or not. Uh, and they have gone all over the place. Uh, in Europe, they're now very low, way below what they were previously. Um, in, in the U.S., uh, some of the per cap and trade prices have gone lower than was anticipated. And the public is very averse to these price changes. So the public doesn't feel comfortable if the price soared on a, on a cap and trade uh, on a cap and trade mechanism, the price of energy soared. Why uh, then people would be accusing Wall Street of manipulating some prices because they the will take positions on these uh, 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 cap and trade uh, systems, uh, and it could end up discrediting the whole movement to uh, to put on an economic basis, uh, on a rational economic basis, the control of carbon. So that's one reason. Another thing that bothers me about a cap and trade international system is that, let's face it, the, the, somehow if this were distributed, there's going to be huge flows of billions, or maybe even trillions of dollars from the U.S. to Ch or advanced countries to China, and I don't think that would be tolerated very well uh, domestically. Uh, so uh, it, 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 I, I myself favor for the international solution uh, an international price or tax on carbon. It's also with a cap and trade system you're into right from the beginning who gets assigned what caps and a lot of money is riding on that. That's right. So I, so you got to negotiate with end parties somehow. It's if not going to happen. Make, it's just not, yeah. It's just it, not, it, it, let me just, I'm going to read a, a paragraph for your, near the opening of your book. It might be the first paragraph. I can't remember. It says, I, but I, I cut and pasted it. It says, climate change is an urgent problem, but you're fooling yourself if you think getting off fossil fuels will be simple. It will be one of the most difficult challenges modern civilization has ever faced, and it will require the most sustained, well-managed, globally cooperative effort the human species has ever mounted. Well, sustained, well-managed, and globally cooperative, uh, I can't think of anything that describes – that we've ever done that, fall, that, that fills those ad adjectives. So uh, it's a long shot. Uh, one nation, a, a particular nation, can put a tax th through its own political process on its own carbon uh, emissions. The odds that we will, as a as a globe, come together to uh, figure out and solve the problems you're talking about seems to me to be close to zero. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> this gets into another point, which is when does the world sort of wake up? And the pessimistic side of me says that it would take the perception of a catastrophe, of a climate change catastrophe, in order to make this be an issue on the grassroots level, like uh, analogous to, to the 2000, 2008 recession. Yeah, to give it salience, for it to, to rise to the level of, of fear and panic in the part of the everyday person, you need to see things like uh, there's no vegetables in the grocery store, or they're – they're only available in a limited basis because of agricultural change, right? And then it's too late, probably, as you'd suggest. That's right, but but uh, uh, I, I, the pessimistic part of me says that that makes the the perception of a catastrophe not uh, exogenous but endogenous. Because if if we go up by another hundred parts per million. Uh, and there's no terrible uh, outcomes perceived, we'll go up another 100 parts per million and then another 100 <clears throat> until there is this perception on a grassroots level that this is really biting, this is really hurting. So then it becomes a question not whether there will be a perceived, it's the perception that's important, a perceived <clears throat> catastrophe, excuse me, but when that will occur. Um, I, 
yeah, the, the, these proposed solutions are all difficult, and cap and trade has some things in its favor over uh, over uh, an internationally agreed upon price. Uh, of carbon, but I think we got going on the wrong foot when we started down, when we began with this quantity path, because it's so very, very difficult to get in countries to agree on what their initial reductions ought to be. Everyone wants some leniency in that. Somehow, a a uniform price, if we can get everyone to agree on a uniform price, and then they, I don't know, vote on it or negotiate what that price is going to be, you're then negotiating with a one-dimensional entity, the price, instead of n-dimensional different uh, caps. And that somehow seems to me uh, to have more promise, uh, but it's not, it ain't easy. Well, I want to read a uh a uh, somewhat lengthy excerpt from the book that I thought really captured the the nature of the problem. And it, it captures this issue, uh, the one we're talking about now, which is uh, the salience issue. Is it w- what's at the front of people's minds and the political challenges of dramatic action if it's not in the front of people's minds? And I think that is part of what drives climate scientists crazy that the rest of us are just kind of like thinking, not much going on here. Why are you yelling at me? And uh, just as an aside, I think the biggest uh, – this is – of course, this, this failure to get people excited about it is despite the a steady drumbeat by the media, which is very – in general more concerned about than the average person, um, movies that suggest it's going to be catastrophic. And I think that one of the reasons it's failed is um, Al Gore being a spokesperson for a movement. He's a politician. He's seen as a partisan, and that immediately – took about 35 percent of the population into hostility toward the idea. Whether that was uh, wise or not is a different question, but I think just an interesting question of why so many smart people are worried about this uh, and so many somewhat smart people are not. There are smart people who are not worried about it. I, we, you know, we've had some of them on the program. Uh, we may hear from them again, but it's an interesting political question of, of how do you get people to worry about a problem that's in the future. And you have a nice metaphor that captures that, and it also captures the uncertainty. So let me, let me read it. If, if a civilization as we know it altering asteroid were hurtling toward Earth, scheduled to hit a decade hence, and it had, say, a 5% chance of striking the planet, we would surely pull out all the stops to try to deflect its path. If we knew that same asteroid were hurtling toward Earth a century hence, we may spend a few more years arguing about the precise course of action. But here's what we wouldn't do. We wouldn't say that we should be able to solve the problem in at most a decade so we could just sit back and relax for another 90 years. Nor would we try to bank on the fact that technologies will be that much better in 90 years so we can probably do nothing for 91 or 92 years and we'd still be fine. We'd act, and soon, never mind the technologies will be getting better in the next 90 years, never mind that we may find out more about the asteroid's precise path over the next 90 years that may be able to tell us that the chance of it hitting Earth is only, in quotes, 4% rather than 5 we'd assume it all along. Uh, so I don't know about that, actually. So when, you, when I read that, you, you, know, you gave that analogy to make a point. I guess the question would be, I'd want to know what pulling out all the stops would do to life here on Earth. It's true that if there's a 5% chance that life on Earth is going to be altered by the impact of this asteroid 100 years from now, I'd be worried about it. I think, yeah, we should do something now. But would I pull out all the stops? Would I devote 50% of world GDP, 30% of world GDP to create the technology that's going to allow us to destroy it or deflect it? I might want to wait a little bit. I might want to invest in those technologies now, but not to solve the problem in 10 years. And I'd want to think about what the scope of it would be. But if it meant impoverishing people, say, terribly, I'd, I'd be loath to attack the problem now. I would be tempted to wait. Or do you think I'm wrong? Uh, well, the way that example was set up, it was as if this is really a catastrophic asteroid – and something's going to have to be done, and it would make people nervous. It would make me nervous to just stall for 10 years even uh, uh, because we really want to dig into the science of this and run some experiments and get in place some asteroid-deflecting technology and so forth. And the fact that that would 
alter or destroy civilization or much of life on earth makes it, it w- would uh, dominate our image or it would dominate mine. And I think that climate change has this, uh, uh, has this probabilistic uncertain aspect to it, but the, uh, the, the probability of really bad outcomes is nerve wrackingly high. And there is a lot of inertia in this. And and people don't, that's another thing that, that makes this so hard to contemplate is very wide misconception on, uh, flows versus stocks. Simple as that to get the the stable uh, is the goal is to stabilize the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's not to stabilize the flow. So if we cap the flow at this year's level, that would not stabilize carbon dioxide stocks, which would continue to rise. Um, the total amount that's already in the atmosphere. Yeah, you, use, you've your, got, use your bathtub analogy because I like that. Yeah, well, it's it's like a bathtub where you. There was water going in, let's say, and there was water coming out of the drain, and the bathtub height of water was something like a foot, 12 inches. And so the incoming water was uh, just matched by the outgoing water, and it remained at this 12-inch level. That's sort of what the planet was like before with respect to carbon dioxide. Now... We've pushed up the spigot so that it's not uh, so that what's happening now, that 12 inches is going up. The stock of it is going up and uh, it's going up as we're turning up the spigot on carbon dioxide. But suppose you said now, wait a minute, we've been turning up incrementally this spigot for 30, 40 years now. Let's stop turning up the spigot. Let's just leave it at where it is now. Then that would continue to accumulate uh, uh, the height of water in the bathtub. So let's say it was 12 inches. We turned up the spigot incrementally with time, and now the water's at 24 inches. So we say, well, let's leave the spigot now at where it is now. It already brought the, the water from 12 inches to 24 inches. If you held it at where... Uh, the spigot at 24 inches is pouring water in, it would cause uh, the height of the water to go, to continue to go up maybe to 36 inches and overflow, uh, and overflow the tub. So it's not nearly enough to stabilize the flows of emissions. It's, you, you, to stabilize emissions, you've got to lower that spigot. You've got to lower the emissions. To stabilize the stock, you you said. Yeah, yeah, to stabilize the water level or the stock of CO2 in the the atmosphere. Yes. And that's the part, that's another part that's just so worrisome that people are thinking in terms of, well, let's limit emissions. Sometimes they're lowered, but let's limit emissions. So the Chinese have, have pledged that as of 2030, they will at least as of 2030, they will start lowering their emissions. Well, uh, uh, they will stabilize or lower their emissions. Well, if they stabilize the emissions levels in 2030, that's still going to cause a massive rise in the stock of CO2 and uh, uh, eventually result in the perception of a catastrophe. So that's... That's alarming, and I I just want to mention that um, I happened to see today on Twitter uh, Nassim Taleb put up a a letter he had co-authored that argues that the increasing amount of uncertainty about the uncertainty just makes the case even stronger that we ought to do something, and I'll try to find a link to that if we can. But on the positive side, um, I want to turn now to geoengineering, which is uh, the last third of the book or so. But before I do, I, I just want to say on the positive side, we have seen some technological improvement, quite dramatic actually, in say the amount of energy that's used per dollar of GDP as technology has gotten more efficient, energy use has gotten more efficient. 
Uh, we have turned increasingly to natural gas because of recent discoveries that is lower carbon content than, uh, than say, um, than uh, oil, crude oil. So there is some it, – it's true. The rate is still increasing of, of the stock in the atmosphere, but it is increasing at perhaps at a slightly decreasing rate even as the people in the world get richer and use more energy, which is something I certainly hope for. So these kind of technological improvements would have to be large enough to offset those increases in, in um, material well-being on those people's parts, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, if you look at uh, carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP, they decrease somewhat, uh, something less than or about 1% a year. But if the world is growing at 2% of the year or China is growing at 7% a year, that overwhelms the lower carbon dioxide emissions per uh, growth of GDP because some of these countries are projected to grow so fast. Uh, and yes, the, the costs have been lowered significantly on solar technology and on wind technology. Uh, the total energy coming from them worldwide is still pretty minuscule. Trivial. Trivial. Yeah, absolutely. And no one is sure what would happen if you had a massive ramp up. If you if you scale this up, uh, if you if you try to think about a world where wind and solar are each contributing twenty five percent or something like that. That is a very different world with windmills all over the place and deserts covered with uh, with solar panels. And neither of those two yet, neither the solar nor the wind, has conquered this uh, devil's problem of how do you store the stuff? Yeah. Because they're intermittent sources. They're not, they can't be base loaded. You can't depend upon them. The only technology out there that is carbon free that is tested it would be base loaded nuclear uh, the Ooh, french don't say that word that's right <laughs> that's right no that's the that's the that's the only really attractive viable solution at least right now but it's um got a lot of bad pub <laughs> and perhaps yes, deservedly yes. so i don't know if that's fair but I, I think it's undeserved. People just have a, a fear button on that side. Uh, you know, the French have lower, significantly lower emissions of carbon dioxide per French citizen than the Germans have emitted carbon dioxide per German citizen. And Germany has really pulled out a lot of the stops. So there's a lot of wind power there. Yep. There's a lot of solar. But they still are nowhere near the French level, which is based primarily on uh, on nuclear power. Yeah, it's it's gotten a bit, a very bad press. Uh, I think uh, there are problems with it. There's problems, with it, but everything has to be viewed yeah. in the light of what the alternatives everything, are. Everything has problems. And, Camels in yeah. Canada, which is a, an image that you evoke. Uh, if we approach some of the um, prehistoric levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Campbell's in Canada is not a – that's a horrifying thought. Yes, a nuclear meltdown that gives people a higher chance of cancer at a younger age is, is a terrible tragedy. Uh, but it, it probably beats not being able to grow food in most of the world or many other things we could imagine. Uh, it's an interesting challenge that the activists who are most worried about climate change are often most hostile to nuclear for whatever reason. It would be, it'd be interesting to, to – collect all of the politically viable, imaginable things we could think of short of cap and trade, short of a $40 carbon tax. If we let nuclear be easier to get to, if we increased urbanization, if we made it easier to get to natural gas, if we gave a prize for solar and, and wind, things that are not – those are all politically viable – Maybe not the nuclear right now, but the other ones we could imagine. It would be interesting to – I don't – if anyone's ever tried to calculate how much we could dent the problem with those kind of – with a cumulative bunch of solutions like that, policies like that. Yeah, calculations have been made uh, and uh, 
likely it would come out a major player if you had a high enough price on carbon. Uh, the typical environmentalist is it views uh, the uh, climate change problem as urgent, as some as a big problem. They also are opposed typically to nuclear power and to genetically modified organisms. And I think they've got one of those three right. That's that the climate change really is dangerous and scary. But I don't agree with the positions on the other two. Uh, so Mark Linus, who's a, a famous environmentalist and has written on climate change and lots of other environmental issues, uh, agrees on this, that nuclear power has a real place and it's important and genetically modified organism, genetically modified food, uh, looks like it could be a real boon. So, uh, most of the scientists that work with, uh, climate change think it's worrisome. The scientists that work with, directly with nuclear power think that's manageable. And the scientists work with genetically modified organisms think there's a tremendous amount of promise or alleviating hunger and doing other good things around the world. So this uh, environmental movement has split from the scientific consensus, as it were, on these two, on nuclear and genetically modified organisms. Well, I do worry uh, about their objectivity. Where you, you would expect engineers in the nuclear field to be optimistic about its safety, perhaps. Maybe you'd expect scientists working on GMOs to be less worried about it than others. But there is evidence that, that those things are relatively safe or at least not as likely to be catastrophically destructive as a uh, six plus degrees Celsius uh, increase. Yeah. So yeah. Um, let's move to geoengineering. I, I found that quite interesting. I, we've talked about it very briefly in the past on the program and just touched on it. And you go into some detail. Why don't you start with talking about Mount uh, Pinatubo, the volcano, and what that did as a way to open people up to the idea that uh, there could be some improvements of geoengineering, in particular, the leveraging effect uh, that you talk about is very dramatic and uh, provocative. Yes, well, Mount Pinatuba uh, w uh, was an explosive uh, volcanic eruption that threw lots of stuff into the sky and lots of it high up into the stratosphere. And it sent out a massive amount of, not a massive amount, but a large amount of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. That acted, that combined with other molecules there, acted as a reflector of the sun, and it cut sunlight by one or two percent, which was enough to send temperatures down by a half a degree centigrade for the next year or two. And we've known about this effect of uh, ex uh, of calderas of explosive volcanoes for a long time, and and their effects have been observed over centuries. That uh, after after the, in their aftermath, uh, temperatures go down significantly, and the idea is okay. This is done by nature, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, why don't human beings imitate nature? Would that be a good policy to actually seed the stratosphere with sulfur dioxide? Uh, uh, it's one of the things that is amazing about this is how incredibly cheap it is to lower temperatures by geoengineering, solar radiation management forms of geoengineering. To lower Earth's average surface temperature by one or two degrees centigrade would cost less than $10 billion a year. Uh, you need a fleet of planes or rockets or something like that to keep pushing this stuff uh, into the stratosphere. But there's not that much that's needed, and it's incredibly cheap. So you compare what it costs to lower temperatures by a degree uh, from uh, geoengineering – with how much it would cost to lower temperatures by a degree uh, via um, uh, new technologies or via solar and and wind, uh, it, it, it it's overwhelmingly cheaper to fool with the sulfur dioxide, and that's something we didn't need. We don't need the climate change is already 
economics of climate change is already the economic problem from hell because of all these complexities, because it's a, 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 an international public good, because of timing, because of lots of things. It's a and wicked problem. Got, and now you've got – you suddenly made it more wicked because – You've really got two externalities or public goods out there. The one, the traditional one, is that people free ride because it's so expensive to change from a carbon burning technology. And uh, everyone wants to free ride. Here you've got the opposite kind of a public goods or international problem where many, many nations and even individuals could afford this $10 billion a year. And somehow you need governance over both of these things. So in a sense, it's twice as difficult a international public goods problem as we thought it was before uh, geoengineering emerged as a kind of a conceptual, at least, alternative. It seems like a very attractive insurance policy – on the surface, uh, I guess the the issue, which is which you touch on in the book, is well, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that's playing God, and well, we're already playing God. We're putting the we're pumping the carbon into the atmosphere, so that part's not so alarming. It's really the unintended consequences. So, w- what do we know, if anything, about this little? You just sort of say, well, you just put a bunch of planes up there, you put out the sulfur into the atmosphere. It, it, what are the worries? Oh. There are many worries. Um, uh, I, I think this has a place as a kind of a plan B in case. So we need to do research to know what this is about just in case some cat- catastrophic outcomes emerge. Uh, you, you've got uh, a series of issues where it, it, it would affect the weather patterns, uh, uh, it would affect the the uh, uh, it would affect the weather patterns. It's probably going to make the ozone hole more of a problem. Uh, it, uh, it ocean acidification would proceed apace because you're not re- you're not changing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You are changing the uh, amount of sunlight that's hitting the earth, basically, uh, there's an argument that you might become dependent upon this. Suppose that you uh, are are thinking of temporary uh, particles like sulfur dioxide, which will come out of the stratosphere uh, within a year or so. Suppose you got hooked on that and then you discovered that it's got some very bad side effects, maybe some black swan side effects that you that are really bad, terrible. Feedback that loops that you didn't want to wear. Right, and- right, right. Now if you go off of that uh, uh, um, solar radiation management geoengineering, there's an abrupt increase in temperatures. So this thing is a blessing and a curse. It will It will immediately cause the temperatures to go down. Uh, but if you wanted to get away from it, it will immediately cause the temperatures to go up uh, throughout the planet uh, uh, in too rapid a way. Uh, you, you, uh, there's, a, uh, there's this hubris argument that I think carries a lot of weight that, look, we geoengineered the planet already. That's what's causing the problem of, uh, of climate change and the problems of future climate change. Uh, uh, now we're going to geoengineer it the opposite way. There's too much human tampering uh, with the system. Uh, there's a moral hazard type of an argument that's out there that if – I don't myself much subscribe to this, but if people knew that this cheap method was available for cutting down carbon dioxide, they would uh, uh, they would go towards that as a solution rather than cutting carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, right, so we can't so talk about a, it. We, it's too dangerous. A, <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of possibly bad issues. It's a gamble. Um, well, I'll, you, go ahead. I, well, what I think is we need more research in this area. That truly can be said. So. We shouldn't be – it's probably politically correct not to do any research in the area, but we need more research even if we're not using this thing. Uh, even if we come down deciding it should not be used, we need research on how this is going to be done, what the effects would be, 
and uh, and so forth. And I think it needs to be out there as a plan B, uh, just in case. Uh, your remark about hubris uh, that this is how we got in the problem. You know, our, our overconfidence in our ability to manage the planet is how we got in the pro- into the problem to start with, and that we could fix it by doing the same thing. I just have to say, having seen Avengers: Age of Ultron this week, uh, that it's the Tony Stark effect, uh, which you know it's kind of a spoiler, perhaps. So I, I don't want to say it how, how how it turns out in the movie, but there is this. Uh, I've kind of got my tongue in cheek there because it's hard to imagine that I could spoil the um, ending for anybody, uh, whether it's a happy or an unhappy one. But um, I want to close with a sociological observation and, and let you respond to it. I found uh, your book pushed me somewhat toward being more concerned about climate change than I was before. I, I'm in the in generally in the agnostic skeptic uh, camp mainly because I, I do see these parallels with macro. I'm not really convinced that macro is much of a science, and I see a similar complexity problem unroll, unfurling in, in climate change and a similar problem with the advocates being way too confident uh, given what I see as the uncertainty about their estimation techniques in science. Your book is a breath of fresh air in that sense in that you don't, you don't over-claim – you are extremely modest, and despite that modesty, you still want some dramatic solutions, which I'm slightly more interested in, in being in favor of after reading your book. Do you think this this clamor on the part of scientists and activists, the overconfidence that they project relative to the imprecision of their numbers is part of the problem? Do you think that the – the problem has been marketed badly, to put it in bald language, because I do. I, I referred earlier to Al Gore being a spokesperson. I think that was a terrible marketing blunder, and no one chose it. It just happened because of his prominence and Nobel Prize and all that, But and in his, in his movie. Um, but do you think that if – in terms of speaking to your fellow worriers, and you, I would put you in the worrying camp, do you think tone and um, – and style are important in, in getting people to change their minds or to be alarmed about something that might be 100 years away? I think it probably does play a role, and I've thought about what is the best way to present this. I don't know any other way except that it's got to emphasize that we'll probably be all right if we can keep levels moderate, uh, but – it does have this disaster side to it, which really should make people nervous. Um, if it's if cl- some climate scientists or the majority come across as overly confident, um, I know they can't be confident about. They can be confident about the big picture, but they can't be confident about very many specifics at all. And it's sort of this asymmetric distribution where, okay, they're, 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 by their talking, maybe they're conveying that they're more sure than they actually are. But uh, if they're wrong in one direction, the consequences are much greater than if they're wrong in the other direction, and that's still a huge part of the problem. Uh, it's a wicked problem because of this timing uh, you got you've got something occurring that's very long by the uh, measures of the political cycles or people's lifetimes even uh, but it's remarkably short by uh, it's a remarkably short experiment by geo by geophysical uh, yeah. Yeah. so it's in this nev- and that's what causes a lot of the uncertainty we haven't seen this for millions of years uh, so it's right there in between. It's geologically instantaneous, which makes us very unsure about the probabilities and everything else about it. And it's much longer than even a human lifetime, uh, which makes people want to put it away and say, let's worry about this when it starts occurring. Well, you and I will probably not be alive in 2100. Um, I don't expect to be, but there's a pretty good chance that my children – were born in the all born in the 1990s. There's a pretty good chance they'll be alive in 2100. Um, you know, they they may not make it for a bunch of reasons, obviously, but there's a chance that they will. 
if they have children, uh, they will – those children are very likely to be alive in 2100. So my grandchildren are – it's their lives are at risk. It, it's not that long a span. Uh, I guess it's hard to think about your unborn grandchildren and worrying about them. But certainly the next generation, either my children or their children's children, will have a – uh, worry about this if it is indeed worrisome, they will be very different from ours because they will live longer. It will fall much more likely likely to it's more likely to fall in their lifespan. I agree with you. Look, twenty one hundred. It's very hard to think of. It's so far away. But what makes the part of again making this problem so devilish is that a lot. If there's going to be bad consequences, really bad consequences, they're going to come in after 2100. So you're sort of, our actions now and in the near and middle future are going to impact the planet, not just in 2100. Certain things will be showing up by then, I believe. But beyond that, you're condemning sort of uh, future centuries to some very bad things. Uh, so that's how that people can't even think in terms of 2100. How are they supposed to think in terms of 2200, which well, is when a, a lot of disastrous things really would start to materialize. A couple of weeks ago, we had we had Eric Topol on talking about technological change in medicine. So we'll be living to 150, 200 years soon, no doubt. Uh, although he did not predict that. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But there are some interesting things coming in technology for medicine that may extend lifespans. We'll see. Uh do you want to close with that something optimistic? That was a pretty that was a pretty cheerless uh, close. Do you have anything optimistic to say? Uh, well, anything optimistic. <laughs> uh, I keep chipping along, uh, hoping for the realization that uh, they're uh, hoping for the realization that we need to put a price on uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Uh, and uh, maybe we can push that argument forward to uh, where people find it acceptable. Uh, there was an interesting, very interesting experiment in British Columbia where they put a tax on carbon, but they rebated it by having a per capita check to everyone go out. And they very wisely first had the check go out uh -huh. and then put in the tax yeah. on, on carbon. And that worked. It worked as, at first. It was very controversial. Uh, uh, business didn't like it, and but they they got it through. And now, if you you now it's so ingrained that if you're going to take off that tax, it's politically difficult because then you've got to name where you're going to get the taxes from. So my hope, the optimistic thing, is that more and more of the world sees this British Columbia style system and uh, is enticed to adapt it. My guest today has been Martin Weitzman. His book is Climate Shock, The Economic Consequences of a Hotter Planet. Martin, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you for having me. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.